Good afternoon, everyone. We are live uh, from Singapore and Hawaii. I would like to say good afternoon uh, to all of you, wherever you are in the world. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to read some uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, please put your microphone on mute. Uh, while, the, while our guest lecturer is delivering his public lecture, uh, the questions, you have two options to write them, either on the Q&A section or on the chat function. You can also use your microphone to ask your questions live during the Q&A. If you are having some technical issues, use the chat function to inform our event organizers. And uh, lastly, uh, we have a poll at the end of this public lecture. We encourage you to please uh, take the poll and uh, uh, we would like to let you know that this public lecture is recorded for publicity reasons. So uh, really, I'd like to, on behalf of James Cook University Singapore or uh, James Cook University community, it's my privilege to welcome you to this public lecture. Uh, my name is Nimrod. I'm a lecturer of business communication at James Cook University, Singapore. And today uh, you will be listening to a public lecture on theorizing communication from an Asia-centric perspective. So we have this great opportunity to listen to Professor Akira Miyahara, who will discuss how some of these Western constructs of communication might mischaracterize Asian cultures. And he will share more about what we can learn from Japanese communication. This is, to me, a unique opportunity to explore a field that is communication that, that has often gone overlooked. And again, an opportunity for all of us to deepen our understanding of communication theory as a growing field. And in this, if in this, in this lecture, uh, viewing it or understanding it or exploring it from an Asia-centric lens. So without much ado, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Caroline Wong. Dr. Caroline Wong is our Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching at James Cook University, Singapore, and at the same time, a senior lecturer in the JCU Singapore Business School. Uh, she has been teaching cross-cultural management as well as business communication, uh, both in JCU Singapore and the University of Queensland in Australia. So over to you, Dr. Caroline. Thank you, uh, Nimrod, for that very uh, warm introduction. Uh, I feel very privileged and honored uh, to be given this uh, time to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar, uh, in particularly to our Professor Akira Miyahara. Uh, good afternoon to you, our distinguished guests, uh, our fellow colleagues from JCU, uh, and as well as the students you know, who are listening in. Uh, it's uh, again my honor to warmly welcome you on behalf of JCU Singapore to a very important topic that is worthy of our attention today, and that is theorizing communication from an Asia-centric perspective. There's no doubt that this area of scholarship embraces the diversity of Asia with this very rich Asian traditions, values, beliefs, and assumptions. And I'm so glad that amongst our audience here, we do have that diversity. And I have no doubt that with the insights provided by Professor Akira, with his expert uh, knowledge on cross-cultural communication styles and conflict management styles, with particular insights into the Japanese psyche, and later on with a reaction from Dr. Florine Ocleret, and of course, with the audience active participation in the Q&A, I am very sure this will be a very enriching session. And for us all, I hope that 
This webinar will help widen the field of this course and facilitate the emergence of new insights from various cultures that make it possible to better comprehend and conceptualize the act of communication from an Asia-centric perspective. So I want to wish you all a very fruitful and enjoyable discussion. And many thanks again for your presence and your participation in this webinar. Have a good afternoon. Back to you, Nimrod. Thank you, Dr. Caroline Wong, our Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching at James Cook University, Singapore, for the warm welcome. Uh, without much ado, I'd like to introduce you now to our guest lecturer, Professor Miyahara, Professor Akira Miyahara. Professor Akira Miyahara is a professor of communication studies at the Faculty of Foreign Language Studies in Seinan Gakuin University in Japan. Upon completion of his MA and PhD in communication at Pennsylvania State University, Professor Miyahara spent four years teaching at West Chester University of Pennsylvania. He has been on the faculty at Seinan Gakuin University, his alma mater, since 1986. Professor Miyahara's research interest has been in the areas of interpersonal, intercultural, and medical communication. He has served several academic organizations as a director, including the International Communication Association, the National Communication Association, Japan Communication Association, and the Japanese Health Communication Association. So everyone straight from Hawaii, which is around 10 p.m., if I'm not wrong, please join me in welcoming Professor Miyahara. Let's give Professor Miyahara a virtual round of applause. Over to you, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I turn on my uh, PowerPoint slide presentation, I'd like to say a few things. I'd like to say that uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, to speak to such a diverse audience. Uh, had it not been for pandemic caused by COVID-19, uh, something like this, uh, I'm, I'm in Hawaii right now, addressing a group of people from all over the place, Malaysia, Singapore, Malaysia, maybe Thailand, Vietnam. And also I understand that there are a couple of people who are joining this webinar from Japan as well. So uh, although uh, COVID-19 had its more than fair share of damage to all over the world, uh, we, may, we may need to thank the pandemic for giving us an opportunity like this. It is possible for us to uh, exchange our views online, uh, no matter where you are in the world, as long as you uh, don't mind uh, staying up late or getting up very early in the morning because of the time differences. Well, thank you. So thank you very much again for giving me this opportunity. And I hope that I'm going to be able to live up to your expectations. So that said, let me um, share my PowerPoint presentation uh, that I have prepared for today. Can you all see, see it? Okay. Yes, we can see that, Professor. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Akira Miyahara. I've been teaching at uh, my alma mater, Senangak University since 1986, which is a very long time. Uh, I'm going to say a few things about myself later on because uh, my academic background has something to do with uh, my academic stance, so to speak, that I have for the uh, uh, approach towards uh, intercultural communication as well as cross-cultural communication, cross-cultural comparison of interpersonal communication between uh, groups of people, including Japanese, uh, Chinese, Koreans, uh, Americans, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I regret to say that I have not paid, I have not been able to pay much attention to Singaporeans yet, but I hope that uh, by the end of the lecture today, uh, some people in the audience may be interested in joining, joining me uh, in some kind of collaborative academic work uh, so that we can make some comparisons between 
Asians as well. It is so, so easy and sometimes fascinating to make a comparison between two very di diverse groups of people, such as Japanese and Americans. Everything is so different. But at the same time, we may be overlooking some subtle but very important differences among Asians ourselves. Uh, we use the term Asia or Asian as though there is only one Asian culture. But of course, Singaporeans are very different from Japanese. Japanese are very different from Indians. Indians are very different from, say, Chinese. So we cannot really talk about Asia as though there is only one group of cultures that is called Asia or Asian. So it's important for us Asian uh, scholars as well as students to get together um, um, pick our brains with one another, so to speak, so that we can contribute to a better understanding of intra-Asian uh, differences and similarities, as well as uh, intercultural differences and similarities between Asians and Europeans, Americans, and, and so on and so forth. Um, communication is a very young field, uh, young academic field in Japan. When I say communication, I want you to uh, realize that I'm not talking about mass communication. Uh, the studies in mass communication, including TV, film, radio, newspapers, have had a long history in, uh, in many Asian countries, including Japan and China. But here, when I say communication, I'm talking about person-to-person -person communication in, in many uh, situations, such as uh, between your family members, uh, communication that takes place between you and your professors, uh, communication that takes place between doctors and patients, between doctors and other what we call co-medicals, including nurses, um, pharmacists, and so on and so forth. So this, uh, when I say communication here, I, I am um, referring to face-to-face, -face, basically face-to-face uh, -face, uh, communication that takes place between at least two people. So communication in that, uh, in that sense has a very young history in Japan. Uh, there is no hardcore evidence to pinpoint the beginning of the study of communication studies in Japan, but I would personally say that uh, uh, in early 1970s was a time when people started recognizing the importance of studying face-to-face uh, -face interpersonal communication. And also, um, I, I was the president of Japan Communication Association uh, some time ago. And this year, 2021, was the 50th anniversary of Japan Communication Association. So of course, you know, for, for pe young people like you, 50 years is a long time, but for an academic discipline to be in existence for 50 years indicates that it's a very new discipline. What happened in 1970s? Uh, I was only 15 or 16 years old. And when Apollo 11 of the United States uh, landed on the moon for the first time, which was the first time uh, incident for humankind, uh, there was a professional called simultaneous interpreter. And I watched those simul uh, interpreters uh, translating from English to Japanese or Japanese to English uh, simultaneously. I was really, um, pleasantly shocked to see uh, language barriers can be bridged by professionals like that. And since then, it is my feeling that many people have started paying a lot of attention to uh, using English in international settings and also communicating with people with English speaking people, Commun communicate, communicating with English speaking people. Uh, in 1971, John Morrison, an American scholar in rhetoric, uh, published an article in uh, Quarterly Journal of Speech, whose title was The Absence of Western Rhetorical Tradition, colon, Japan as a Rhetorical Vacuum. If he had written this article today, this article would not have been published in any professional journal, because in this article, he said that since Japanese people do not have any rhetorical traditions, they have never been taught how to, how to communicate, or they have never been taught how to uh, persuade one another 
and therefore Japanese don't know how to persuade. This is such a biased ethnocentric uh, article and a lot of people in Japan were really mad to see this article. But now in retrospect, I think we should, we should thank this article or thank John Morrison for writing this uh, really bold ethnocentric uh, article uh, calling Japan as, uh, as, as completely behind in rhetorical tradition. It is true that Japan does not have a, a strong tradition in pursuing Western rhetoric, but that, that, that is not to say that Japanese people do not know how to persuade. So we should uh, thank Morrison for giving us the reason to study communication uh, characteristics of Japanese people. And also in 1975, uh, Dean C. Bonland, uh, who was a professor at San Francisco State University in the United States, did a very extensive study comparing Japanese and US college students in terms of the stereotypes and also self-disclosures. To what extent you talk about yourself and what about yourself you talk to other people, including strangers, friends, parents, and people like that. So that was the first uh, study, first extensive study, uh, making a systematic comparison between Japanese and American uh, populations in terms of their communication behavior. And that I think served many Japanese scholars in communication, communication studies as, a, as an in initial uh, pioneer to get us started. Um, as I said before, I would like to say just a few things about myself. I went to Senangaku University uh, only because uh, the, the university has had a long established international relationships with many universities across the world. Even though when I was a student, uh, we only had exchange programs with about four universities in the United States and two universities in France but I wanted to study abroad, especially in the United States really badly. And that was the reason I uh, decided to go to Senangaku University. And many scholars that are teaching and doing research in the discipline of communication, uh, you know, follow the same or similar academic career as I have. Uh, we began as students of English. So many of my friends uh, went, to, went into linguistics, some into English literature, and a few like myself went to pursue uh, further study in the United States in the communication discipline. So most of the people that are teaching and doing research in Japan in the field of communication are, uh, have followed the same kind of uh, uh, academic path, uh, beginning with English majors, and went to the United States to study more English, English literature, or communication. So that explains why not only Western researchers, but also Asian, and in this case, Japanese researchers have been approaching the study of Japanese communication from the Western perspectives. So we cannot speak badly about people like Morrison because we are also the ones who are uh, trapped in our own trapped, tra trap in a sense. As I also said before, um, Japan US comparisons of communication studies have become a boom since 1970s or 1980s because it's fun to find a lot of differences, very extreme differences between Japanese and Americans. Americans are considered to be low context communicators, meaning that they do not rely so much on contextual information, but they rely on words and nonverbal signs that they actually, actually uh, exchange in the communication situation. Whereas many Asians and particularly Japanese are considered to be high context communicators. We don't say much, but we sort of take it for granted that we know what the other person is thinking about. So by, uh, we have a saying that goes like, uh, hear one and understand 10. People are not going to tell you everything. They, might, they may tell you only about 10% of what they want to say, 
but it is your responsibility to figure out the rest of 90% of what the other person wants to say. Of course, that is an extreme way of putting it, but uh, uh, again, US communication is typically low context and Japanese communication is typically high context. Americans are considered to be individualistic, whereas many Asians, uh, including Singaporeans to, to a great extent, are considered to be collectivistic. Uh, again, this is a very uh, dichotomous and also um, uh, clear, uh, clearly dividing concept, uh, dividing the, the populations of the world into collectivistic or individualistic. And uh, th this concept has got a lot of mileage out of it because uh, this was a very convenient set of concepts that can help many researchers conduct their research about different peoples in the world in terms of their work ethics, for example. Independent, interdependent, or independent self-control. Collectivism and individualism is the cult culture level characteristic of uh, uh, self-orientation, whereas interdependent and independent self-control are independent level of uh, self-orientation. So many people in collectivistic cultures are regarded to be interdependent, whereas many people in the in individualistic cultures are considered to be independent. The self is within themselves, whereas for interdependent people, they, uh, the self is in between themselves and people around them. So interdependent people tend to be concerned about how they are evaluated by others around them. Whereas independent people just go ahead on their own and later maybe worry about themselves. Okay, so uh, applied to um, a conflict situation, uh, many uh, Westerners, Euro Europeans and, and Americans tend to uh, value direct confrontation in a conflict situation. They just want to go ahead and say what they, what they have to say. And also they will listen to what other people have to say, but uh, it is a perfect opportunity for them to exchange ideas. You are, you are expected to be different from other people. So might as well let other people know how different you are from them. Whereas in in a collectivistic and interdependent and also high contextual culture like Japan, uh, we tend to believe that once we have a conflict with other people, then the relationship ends right there. So we do not value direct confrontation with other people about, about any issues. So we tend to avoid conflict altogether. And avoidance, avoidance is regarded as the most ineffective and probably the worst way of dealing with conflict in many Western cultures. So that shows how Western people, Western researchers of communication approach Asian ways or Japanese ways of dealing with conflict. I, I strongly argue that avoidance is not the worst way of dealing with conflict, but it, it is a very competent uh, way of dealing with differences in opinions in many Asian cultures, including Japan, and maybe uh, to a certain degree, Singapore, Singaporean culture as well. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, Asia, as I said, has been considered to be just one big group of cultures by many US Americans and also Europeans. Uh, Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese may be uh, grouped together in one category. Uh, Singaporeans, Malay, Malaysians, Indonesians, and maybe Filipinos may be put in together in one category. Indians, Pakistanis may be in, in another ca category. And also when you stretch to the West, of course we have Iran and Iraq as part of Asia. And, those people are certainly different from Singaporeans, Japanese, and Koreans. So we cannot just talk about Asia as though there is one huge group of Asian cultures. There are many uh, subtle but very important differences among Asian cultures, and they are all overlooked by many Western researchers and to a certain degree by, by many Asian scholars as well. 
I have done uh, I have done a small research study with my Korean uh, colleague who is now teaching at University of Hawaii. Uh, we know that uh, Koreans and Japanese may uh, share some things together, but definitely Koreans and Japanese are not the same. So we tr wanted to figure out what differences there may be between Koreans and Japanese in terms of how we deal with conflict. St statistic statistically speaking, we found out that uh, Japanese were more, con more concerned about effectiveness and clarity in their communication. And I, I just don't buy it, although that's a study that I have done uh, with my Korean colleague. Uh, Koreans seem to be much more uh, concerned about how effectively and clearly they want to get their messages across to other people, whereas Japanese just don't say anything in many co conflict situations. So th that was a quantitative study uh, and the results were very confusing. The irony was that I don't speak any Korean and my, my Korean colleague doesn't speak any Japanese. So we had, to we had to conduct this questionnaire, first of all, in English and translated that into Korean and Japanese. So the irony was that even though when uh, the, the two Asian scholars got together to do this research together, uh, we could not do it in, in the original uh, local language of either Korean or, or Japanese. So that's the uh, that's that's another problem of uh, doing conducting intercultural communication research. Uh, collectivism, individualism, independent, interdependent, self constructs have been have been very popular concepts. However, uh, there have been a lot of recent, recent studies that have reported many unexpected and contradictory findings about Asian communication. For example, Japanese have been found out to be much more competing than Chinese, for example. And Americans, British and French are, have been found to, to prefer more indirect and also avoiding strategies, strategies than Japanese. That's completely opposite to what we have believed so far. So many of the concepts, although they were very popular for so many years, may not be very good or accurate ways of uh, making comparisons between or among Asian people altogether. Okay, so this is a, a situation. This is th this is a, a this is what we call come a dual concern model. Vertically, we have a concern for the other person in a conflict situation, and horizontally, we have concern for self. The farther right you go, the more concern you have for yourself. The the higher up you go, the more concern you have for the other person in a conflicting situation. So where um, both strong concern for self and strong concern for the other meet, we have integrating. So you have strong concern for yourself as well as for the other person in a conf conflicting situation. So when uh, the issue is so big, so for example, if, if a large company is trying to make a major shift in their policies or regulations, or, or uh, company philosoph philosophies even, they would have to spend a lot of time uh, uh, using a lot of information and they have to come to a solution that each party can be satisfied with. So that's called integrating. Other strategies, dominating, accommodating, are, uh, sound like really uh, weak strategies or too strong strategy for dominating, but they're not necessarily ineffective strategies in a conflict situ situation. There are many situations where the leader has to dominate other people and the followers simply have to listen to the leader without voicing their opinions. And halfway between is called compromising, okay? The reason why I'm, I marked avoiding in red is that it's considered to be, as I said before, the most ineffective and worst strategy by Western people, especially Western researchers in communication studies. But I would strongly argue that uh, Japanese and probably many Asians would really go out, go out of their ways in order to avoid 
direct confrontation, or direct conflict with other people. And it, it is not necessarily a bad way of dealing with conflict. And so that's my argument. Because we have strong concerns for maintaining our face. I, I believe in Chinese it's, called, it's pronounced mianzi. Uh, it is a very uh, Asian concept. Uh, your identity, that, that is your identity. The way you want other people to see you constitutes your face. So conflict is a very strong face threatening process. You can lose your face, you can lose, the, you can cause the other person to lose his or her face. And as a, as a result of that, you can lose your face. And the relationship can end forever because of the conflict. So conflict is a very uh, interesting and excellent communication context for study. Because if you are simply chit-chatting with your friends over lunch, you don't have to have a whole lot of communication strategies. All you can do is simply uh, have fun and, and say goodbye and see you later, see you tomorrow or something like that at the end of lunch. However, when you have a conflict with another person, so much is at stake. So it forces all the parties involved in a conflict situation to, to deploy, so to speak, all the communication skills and knowledge that they have in store in order to protect themselves and in order to protect the other person's face. So conflict, although it, it's not a very fun uh, moment to experience, it could serve us as researchers as an excellent communication context for study. So if you are interested in, uh, in collabor collaborating with me, conflict between say doctors and patients uh, about the way of uh, medical treatment can be a life-threatening situation, literally. So that may be one interesting situation where we can do some collaborative study, making comparisons between Singaporeans and Japanese doctors or Japanese patients and Singaporean patients. The last uh, item on this slide, a variety of strategies to avoid conflict and conf confrontation have been employed by many Japanese. And I've written that uh, sentence in Japanese. It says, kūki o yomu. Kūki, the first two ch characters uh, refer to air. And the last two uh, letters, yomu, uh, refer to read. Read the air, read the air. To give you an example, when I ask my students in a large class a question, nobody raises their hands. Nobody says anything at all. And when I ask them to write reports and give them to me later on, they come up with some excellent ideas in their reports. So I asked some, some of them, why didn't you say these things in class? Always, I get the same answer. They say, because nobody else said anything. I did not want to destroy the air of the class. So the air, whatever, whatever it is, is somehow telling them to be quiet. Nobody wants you to say anything. Nobody wants to say anything. So that's the air and you have to read it. Nobody is going, nobody is going to tell you to be quiet. But in order for you to be accept, accepted as a, a member of that, community, class, group, or whatever you may belong to, uh, reading the air is an important skill that you have to have uh, in Japanese communication. Okay, to give you, uh, I, have, I have just a few more slides. Uh, gift giving, it's sometimes called pre-giving. Uh, when you, when you uh, begin a business uh, transaction with somebody, uh, hoping that you're going to uh, uh, agree on a, uh, on a million dollar contract or something like that. It is customary for Japanese people to give some gifts to the other person. And the person who has received a gift is considered, is expected to return a gift back to the original sender. But you have to be careful not to uh, exceed the amount of the original gift. Because you, if you return 
much more expensive gift to the person who has originally given you the gift, then that's going to cause the face loss of the original giver of the gift. Okay, uh, top left, we have a, a flower vase, which looks very expensive. I don't know how expensive it is, but uh, it, is, it is just simply a flower, flower vase with uh, uh, a gold, golden and silver uh, powder on it with, with a couple of uh, cranes uh, flying. Uh, uh, right immediately uh, below that is a teacup that is traditionally used in a tea ceremony in Japan. And that again, looks very expensive, although it is nothing but a teacup. Now, usually when you give a gift, uh, mid middle top uh, shows the, uh, the envelope with a little uh, decoration mark on top of it, yellow, uh, white, and uh, uh, red strings. That indicates a happy gift that you're giving to somebody who is likely to take care of you later on. So you're supposed to wrap your gift in, a, in, in, in that kind of envelope and also in that kind of a cloth. Uh, below that, we have a Japanese doll in a glass case. And uh, top right, we have a wooden, wooden uh, box. Guess what's in it? Mango fruit. Uh, I'm sure that you, you, you do have a lot, of, a lot of mango fruit in Singapore, but this particular kind of mango fruit in Japan could cost up to 75 Singapore dollars. One piece, one mango could cost up to 75 Singapore dollars. And looks like this, this box can hold maybe four of them. So it could turn into a very expensive mango gift. So we give gifts and return gifts as a, as a, a gesture so that we can uh, avoid conflict. Uh, something like this would not be, uh, would not make any sense in many Western countries, Western cultures. Okay, so as I said, uh, many people try not to say anything at all, uh, thinking that they are reading the air reading the air. And, and also, you know, and of course, if you read the air correctly and appropriately in a given situation, you can avoid conflict. However, there are so many dark sides to it. First of all, contempt, uh, meaning that you may, be, you may be agreeing publicly, but you are disagreeing privately. So you may be saying a lot of things against the issue or against the other person, behind the scenes. So that's, that's very insincere uh, and also, uh, uh, also uh, almost unethical way of behaving. So if, if people read air too much, then that might lead to contempt. Lost opportunity for honest and open challenge. As I said, Japanese people do not like uh, open exchanges of ideas, opposing ideas. But unless we have an opportunity to know what the other person is thinking about, how different it might be from your own opinion, we would not be able to hope for a regular consensus to be built. So by reading air, by protecting people's faces too much, we may be losing great opportunities for great decisions to be made. Big mouth person is always disliked, particularly in, in a high context culture such as Japan. But those people with big mouths may have strong leadership, but only because they talk too much, only because they talk too straightforwardly, may be criticized by other people as ineffective or unfavorable leaders. I don't know how many pri Japanese pri prime ministers we have known, but most prime ministers of Japan are relatively quiet in comparison to other, especially uh, Western, American, uh, European uh, leaders. The fourth one is no expression of op opinions may lead to no opinion. My students particularly may be getting too much used to not, not saying anything at all in class. And I've been telling them that uh, don't get too comfortable not saying anything in class because sooner or later, 
if you get too much used to and comfortable not saying anything in class at all, then you are going to lose anything to say to begin with. Right now, they, they may have a lot of, uh, of, of uh, opinions, but, but they may not know how to voice them, when to say them. But if they get too comfortable not saying them, then they will, they, they will lose whatever opinions they may have. Okay, finally, concern for other as a facade may be concern for self. Japanese people consider, are known to be very polite. If you have been in Japan, I'm sure you have, no, you have noticed that uh, store clerks, even in convenience stores, are very, very polite. They say, いらっしゃいませ, meaning uh, welcome. Uh, they keep talking and they say thank you. And they, they, they wear smiles on their faces all the time. So it's, 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 it's okay to be so uh, polite to their customers. But my feeling is that they may, they are trying to be polite not to please their customers, but to protect themselves. If they are not polite enough, then they may be criticized later on. They may get all sorts of claims as store clerks. So in order not to let that happen to them, they may be trying to be hyper uh, polite, ingratiating to the, to the customers. So by doing that, they may be only protecting them themselves. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to skip this uh, really quickly. Uh, these are the specific tactics that are associated with air reading. Uh, as I said, obey publicly, but at the same time, uh, disobey privately. Shift topics. If, if, the, uh, uh, if the discussion gets heated, then you may want to shift topic to something that is totally irrelevant and uh, uh, unrelated. Uh, delaying answers. Uh, let me think about it. Well, I'll, I'll, get back, I'll get back to you. Is a kind of strategy that many Japanese people use in order to avoid saying no. They are really saying, no, I cannot do it, but I do not want to say no right here, right now in front of you. So uh, I'm going to take my time to think about it, but re really they are saying uh, the answer you're going to get sooner or later is no, whether now or la later, it's going to be no. Hint non-verbally, um, if, you, if, you if you shift your eye contact to something else, uh, if you take a long pause, or if you make a hissing sound like <laughs> that is considered to be a non-verbal sign of no. And ignorant, ignoring, of course, is the most uh, uh, inappropriate and also probably the most impolite way of of responding to the other person. And on and on, there are so many tactics that, that we have available to indicate that uh, we are not agreeing to the other person, in, especially in a conflicting situation. Okay, so by and large, uh, all these, most of the communication studies that I, that I have talked about have been approached by Western researchers and Western researchers tend to uh, uh, ethnocentrically uh, approach non-Western cultures when they study communication. So we have to look at the picture from both sides, not only from the Western side, but also from the Eastern side as well. Uh, we Asian cultures have a lot of profound histories and traditions that affect our, uh, our, our daily social practices, including communication. So it is important for us to spend time uh, studying Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Confucianism and so on and so forth that are prevalent in, in Asian cultures as religions so that we can find out where we stand in terms of uh, how we look at ourselves and how we look at the world uh, when we communicate. Uh, similarities as well as differences between Asia and the West need to be viewed from uh, both angles. And finally, uh, non-Western researchers, for example, from Singapore and Japan uh, need to collaborate to research and theory building that will be com comprehensive to Western counterparts. Yes, the Western researchers are waiting for us to come up with theories that can account for and explain as logically as possible uh, the, the Japanese and Asian communication styles and, and strategies in such a way that they, the Western researchers, can understand. 
Okay, so although I have uh, criticized a lot of uh, Western approaches to Asian communication, I myself find myself uh, approaching Japanese communication from a Western perspective. So I'm so, sort of uh, falling in my own trap and uh, I need uh, a lot of people who can collaborate with me so that I can, uh, so that I can get out of my own trap to up start approaching uh, Asian communication from both angles. Okay, I'm sure that you have a lot of uh, uh, questions, but not only questions, but also uh, opinions, uh, arguments that, that might go against what I have just said, uh, but I would like to welcome them all later on. Okay, so that, that concludes this part of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor uh, Miyahara for that very enlightening lecture. I believe uh, many of those who are listening to you uh, have a lot of questions, uh, and I could actually read uh, some questions on the Q&A section. Uh, I think to actually help us uh, set the Q&A air, the Q&A mode is for me to invite uh, Dr. Furlein Oklarit. Uh, Dr. Furlein, I'm sorry, I lost my slides. Dr. Furlein is a, is a friend, a classmate of mine. Uh, uh, you know, when we all uh, did our doctoral uh, degree at the University of the Philippines. Uh, uh, just a few things about Dr. Furlein Oklarit is that she does a lot of, of studies uh, with communities in transition in the Southern Philippines, that's Mindanao, which is also a conflict ridden uh, region uh, in the Philippines. Uh, she works uh, closely with indigenous people in Muslim Mindanao, and she, I think, contributes a lot to uh, community development projects in the Philippine context. So I think she knows uh, more deeply, rather, about intercultural communication, inter, inter interpersonal communication. So over to you, Dr. Furline, with your reaction and a follow-up question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nimrod Delante. Distinguished Professor Miyahara Akira, I am so overwhelmed by your lecture. I'm grateful for the James Cook University for the invitation to be a, a reactor to this important event. I'm very pleased to participate in this event was your rising communication from an Asian perspective. So earlier I was actually chatting with Dr. Nimrod and I was telling him I should have read Professor Miyahara's work before I finished my dissertation. So clearly listening to Dr. Miyahara kind of helped me understand better the findings of my dissertation. So his lecture comes at a time when as a relatively new scholar of communication and one whose professional playing field is located in one of the most culturally diverse regions in the Philippines. Um, listening to these theories coming from an Asian lens really helped me now better see what findings I had in my dissertation. And I'd like to confirm, um, I was really particularly uh, caught uh, by the high context, low context uh, discussion and discussion on collectivism, which uh, uh, as opposed to individualism, which is characteristic of more Western cultures and interdependence or in-betweenness. So I'd like to pick up on in-betweenness and ask Professor, Miyahara later, if uh, in betweenness uh, to him is a recognition that while you are part of a smaller cultural community, you also recognize that you are part of a bigger cultural community. And so you value interdependence and you put premium on relationships. And that's why uh, we avoid or try to evade conflict. So this helped me understand avoidance, interdependence, collectivism, understand the behavior of some of the indigenous elders that I have come across. So I would be surprised before why they tend to keep mom, to keep to themselves, and they only talk when they are asked to talk, but this uh, 
communication, uh, their, their statements are very minimal, but they were very powerful. And so I, I see that um, Asian communication or theorizing uh, in Asia uh, values relationships, values uh, in betweenness. And then it, uh, because it values relationships, it does not, uh, it, does, it, it provides the field for everyone to be able to express themselves. So I'd like to say that maybe perhaps theorizing communication from the Asian perspective will involve reconceptualization of some of our communicative constructs or communication constructs that we have come across as students or learners of communication and uh, while using and then making full use of the knowledge that we gain from the more marginalized communi communication communities. So I agree with you, Professor. It's time for us to look into ourselves as Asians and study our communication practices and come up with our own indigenous theories. So I'd like to go back to the question on in between in betweenness. Do you take it to mean uh, a recognition that you are part of a smaller community and you are also part of a larger community? And so you this kind of explains for the relationality or the valuing of relationships among Asians. Okay, thank you very much for your very uh, uh, stimulating uh, question and also comment. Um, you know, as we get older, we often say young people today are so and so and such and such. Mm -hmm. And I was, of course, told, told that when I was younger. And uh, they said that in the ancient Roman uh, ruins, there was a saying that uh, young people today, it's, that was written about 2000 years ago. But I tell my students that the last 25 years must have witnessed the, the largest change in communication and communication technology uh, than, uh, that, that humankind has ever witnessed before. So in the last 20, 25 years, because of the technological advancement, including uh, cell phones and internet, I think the communication characteristic, characteristic, characteristics of all over the world have changed so dramatically. So as you said, I think that we'll have to come up with new concepts and constructs in order to uh, see the differences and similarities between people in different parts of the, of the, of, of the, of the world. Uh, high context communication for one thing did work very well for Japanese people maybe 50 years ago when uh, there was so so much limited uh, source of information uh, everybody was watching the same TV program uh, if you if you ask people who is the most popular singer in Japan they would come up with the same uh, same name but of so high context communication operates only as so, so far as people share a lot of information with each other to begin with. Uh, you don't have to be very elaborate in a communication uh, when high context communication operates. But today, as you said, in the community, there is so much diversity. Uh, who is the, the most famous singer? It doesn't register as a question anymore. If I say that to, to, to people in Japan, people they will say, oh, are you talking about like jazz or pop or uh, K-pop or J-pop or, or, or rock or what, what kind of music are you talking about? So depending on the gen genre of music, there are so many, so many popular singers. So that kind of question simply does not work as a question anymore. So as far as I'm concerned, people in Japan, I'm not sure about Singapore, but uh, do not know how to, how to communicate in a high, high context method anymore. And they have not been trained to communicate in the low context either. So we are in between uh, high context and low context. And the worst case scenario is that they cannot, many Japanese people cannot operate on either high context or low context. Now, moving back to the interdependent self-construal, and of course, we are not trying to say that which one which one is better, independent or interdependent. Although uh, many Western people tend to believe that uh, being independent is one of the most important 
values or norms that they would like to maintain. But uh, uh, to many Asians, especially Japanese, uh, interdependent self is considered to be, to, to be the most meaningful self. Uh, to give you an example, uh, Hamaguchi, a sociologist in the 1960s and 1970s, called Jap Japanese people neither collectivistic nor individualistic, neither uh, independent nor in, uh, interdependent. But he called them contextual, meaning that yourself can vary from one context to another. Of course, the way we perform uh, our roles in one situation to another may, may, may change. But the degree to which Japanese people tend to change their role performances from one situation to another is much uh, greater than that for many people. So um, interdependent self-construal uh, values your relationship, relationship with other people. You, you, can, you can identify your own self only in relation to other people. So um, uh, you, you use the word community a couple of times. And many people in Japan have started criticizing the whole society of Japan by saying that there is no community anymore. Uh, there were very many small communities that were part of larger communities, but because of the uh, internet and also because of the diversity and because of the decline of population, which is a major problem in Japan, there, are, there is no more sense of community as there used to be 20, 30 years ago. So that's a that's a major uh, issue that we will have to somehow cope with in the very near future. I don't know if I have answer, answered your question or, uh, or, or not, but uh, that's, that's what I think. Thank you, Professor Miyahara, for your answer. Frau, I believe uh, Professor was able to really answer your question. That's, that's a very good question, by the way. And thank you for, for your reaction. Uh, we have a few more questions, Professor, and I'd like to actually uh, begin with uh, the, the concept of avoidance. It's a question that's asked by two, two of the attendees here. So Ryan uh, asked, uh, how, how then is this avoidance culture affect our effectiveness in negotiation when confrontation is likely? And I'd like to also, I think, uh, read one more question that's very related to this. It's a question that was asked by uh, an anonymous attendee. He said or she said, in avoidance, while an attempt to save face, does it not leave room for frequent misrepresent misinterpretation of intentions and feelings? Yes, they are both uh, excellent questions. Um, avoidance, of course, is, as I said, is considered to be the most ineffective and, and, and the most um, to be avoided kind of uh, conflict strategies in many Western cultures. So uh, as long as we uh, have a pseudo conflict or a possible conflict with another person coming from the same kind of cultural background, we understand what avoidance really means and what avoidance really entails. So, but if we have a conflict or near conflict be between person coming from Asian culture where avoidance may be valued to a greater degree with another person coming from the Western culture where uh, confrontation is much more highly uh, valued than avoidance, then of course, your intention will, may never be known to the other person. And that's why I'm saying that uh, we have to educate. Well, first of all, we have to inform our Western counterparts of the importance of avoidance. Avoidance is not the, the least effective way for many Asians to employ in a con conflicting situation because a lot goes on before the possible conflict situation, during or maybe after the conflict situation. And avoidance is, is, is a strategy. Uh, many Western scholars tend to view avoidance or withdrawal as a as a as a uh, total lack of skills on the part of avoiders, but in order for us to avoid effectively, we have to think a lot. We have to pay so much attention to what goes on, and so avoidance is 
needs to be considered to be a strategy in many cultures. So it is our responsibility to, to let our Western counterparts in business situation, academic situations, or medical situations, or any situation, know that avoidance is indeed a strategy that is valued in many Western uh, uh, Asian cultures. It, it is going to take some time. So that's why um, if you know how to uh, use English or any other Western language, along with the cultural uh, etiquettes and norms and uh, uh, behavior, appropriate, appropriate behaviors, should be able to switch codes when you speak English to an American person uh, in a conflicted, conflicting situation, if you can try to behave like an American person and let the American person know sometime, some other time that avoidance is indeed a strategy that many uh, Asian people, specifically Asian people uh, try to use as an effective strategy. Thank you, professor. Uh, thanks for that answer. There is, I think, a follow-up question that's quite related to avoidance, and that is uh, disagreement. I'd like to, to read the question to you. It's from Kunshana Choinu Urgi. She is actually a statistician by profession, and she's here with us, uh, uh, willing to understand intercultural or communication as a field. Uh, she said, what are your thoughts on the influence of others' reaction as a norm that probably shapes communication strategies Asian persons use, for example, avoidance. Uh, for example, she said, being disagreed with in an Asian context means being challenged or being disrespected or you lose face. Hence, people do not want to disagree with others because disagreeing has social cost. While disagreeing in the West may not be perceived as much reproving as in the East, apart from from personal concerns on protecting themselves, does the norm or the normative perception of action have an impact? I think she's asking about the normative perception of disagreement. You're right. Um, in many Asian cu cultures where disagreeing is not encouraged, uh, if you disagree somebody, especially with, with somebody who, who is above you, more power, who has more power, then it is considered to be very rude. And also you as a person may be considered to be very immature, uh, very uh, impolite, uh, unskillful and so on and so forth. So I don't think that disagreeing for the sake of dis disagreeing is, is, is a good, it's a good idea. But if you, if you have some issues whose outcomes will determine the future of your organization, for example, then standing up on yourself, you know, voicing your opinions as logically as you can is a skill that we will have to acquire in the very near future, if not right now. So depending on the situations and depending on with whom you're speaking, I think that uh, avoidance should be regarded in that specific light and also disagreeing or confronting another person should be uh, viewed in that particular light in that specific situation. So there are so many idiosyncrasies in every situation and I don't think that there, that there, that there is any way we can say across the board that disagreeing is bad or avoiding is good or the other way around. So I think that's that's why you have to be uh, perceptually competent, being able to read the situation and find out what is the most appropriate and effective way of communicating in that situation. By the way, effectiveness and appropriateness are considered to be the two uh, important elements of communication competence. When I say effective, uh, get what you want as a result of communication is, is, is the measure of effectiveness. Appropriateness, of course, regard, uh, refers to uh, whether you are able to say or do things appropriately in a given situation in front of the given people. I don't know if that answers your question on, or not. Um, yeah, if you, if, you, if you keep opening a big mouth all the time, every time when somebody says something to you, uh, 
uh, you disagree for the sake of disagreeing. And of course, you're going to start losing your friends if you have any friends to begin with. But uh, if, if it's a very important issue, not only for yourself, but also for the whole community, group, organization, or country, then standing up on your own opinion of course, does take a lot of courage. And no matter, no matter what other people think of you, uh, I think it is your responsibility as well as your right to say what you have in mind. That I think would contribute to your becoming an ethical, ethical communicator. Ethical person is, an is a very important part of uh, competent communication. Uh, many, people many people tend to believe that communication is just a set of skills. Uh, how to kind of uh, uh, thing is just communication, but that, that it is an important part, but uh, being ethical in, in all the situations is considered to be a very important component of, of competent communication as well. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for that uh, response. Uh, I think there are two questions here that are quite theoretical uh, in nature. A question from Aziza and Irwin. I'd just like to combine the, their questions for you to really react. Uh, Aziza said, do you know if there is an Asian philosophical foundation that may help us to compare different theories regarding face-to-face -face communication? And I think in, in, uh, in support to that, Irwin asked, how can we incorporate more Asian communication theories and theorists in classrooms where Western theories or even theorists take precedence in teaching introduction to communication? Okay, to get back to uh, Aziza, um, I don't know much about uh, religions and religions in, 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 a, in Asia, but from what little I know, I think that the Taoism uh, done by Lao Tzu, uh, we don't know for sure whether Lao Tzu actually existed or not about 2,500 years ago, uh, came up with uh, uh, Taoism. And uh, his philosophy was to say little. Uh, to say nothing is a flower. Uh, to speak is the beginning of a catastrophe. Uh, he says he, he shunned a lot of uh, uh, teachings that are in, endorsed and encouraged in the Western world. Uh, only the fools speak, the wise stay quiet. It is kind of philosophical foundation. So if you bring that up, and then compare that against Aristotelian philosophy, for example. I think we'll, you, you can come up with a very diverse uh, picture of East versus West. Uh, and, uh, and, and from there, we can start some uh, discussion about the differences between Eastern and Western worlds. However, um, we are not consciously uh, being influenced by, so, by those philosophies, are we? Uh, Korea is considered to be a, a country that has been receiving a lot of uh, Confucius uh, influence, but young Koreans don't really uh, seem to be mindful of the Confucius uh, influence on them. So even though there may be all those uh, philosophies and religions that are prevalent in, in Asian cultures, I'm not quite sure to what extent we are actually being influenced uh, by those philosophical teachings or religious principles. So we have to be careful of that. But by showing that this is the typical uh, uh, philosophy or, or religion that many Asian people rely on, uh, bringing up Taoism, for example, to many Western people, it will come to them as a shock. And also it will come to them as a very good set of uh, uh, maybe uh, lessons or, or resource of information. And to Irving, um, this is a very good and challenging uh, question. Um, First of all, in order to, in order to uh, have an argument with Western theorists or, or Western professors who teach communication, we have to sort of uh, 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 arm ourselves with a lot of theories and concepts about uh, Asian communication. 
uh, we, we tell those American professors, uh, French professors or British professors that, oh, no, 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 you, you know, you, you're coming from the Western background and those teachings just do not go well in the Asian culture. Then, of course, they, they will work, welcome your counter argument. They will say to you, okay, so tell me then, tell me what kind of theories and concepts there are to explain Asian communication then that's where we have to stop because we don't have any Asian theories of communication just as yet. There are so many ideas here and there, and we have uh, criticized uh, that the, the uh, one-way imposition of Western theories upon Eastern uh, cultures, but we do not have enough arms, so to speak, to fight back against those uh, uh, Western researchers and Western theorists. So uh, we cannot find just one theory that explains everything about Asian communication. But if you're, if you're interested in say, for example, uh, cross-gender communication between Singaporean women and Singaporean men, and if you do some extensive study to explain some of the typical characteristics of communication that take place that takes place between men and women in Singapore, then that you could present as an interesting theory or theorem to Western researchers. So uh, to make it short, we have to equip ourselves with some explanation that can account for our Asian communication. But uh, um, I'm 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 uh, finishing a chat a book chapter right now. And the more research I have done about Western science and Eastern philosophy, theorizing, you know, coming up with a theory is a Western mode of thinking, isn't it? Western people try, want to try to find a theory that can be generalized to many contexts and apply the theory to explain many things whether it's applicable or not. But Eastern people, Asian people do not really enjoy as much as our Western counterparts in theorizing things. So finding a theory or building a theory even is, is a kind of uh, uh, um, intellectual activity that Asian people are not traditionally uh, fond of or interested in. So that's that's another obstacle that we have to fight against, but uh, we, we, we somehow have to find some way to uh, get even, so to speak, with our Western uh, counterparts. Thank you, Professor. Uh, if I may, just a bit of what I can share about this theorizing. Uh, in our communities in the Philippines, we're so big with speech culture. It's, there's so much talk there. Uh, that sometimes it's it's actually a challenge to ask people to write what they're speaking, uh, to capture that into writing or to capture thinking and the theorizing. And I think, uh, you know, that challenge will continue. But I think uh, the academia has a very important role to really push that. Yes. So that more or less we can capture those theorizing and thinking that's very rich in our oral narratives, uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm which I believe is also similar to other uh, communities in Asia, in Africa, and some parts of the world. Uh, to, to continue with, because I'm, we are also concerned of time, well, we have time, uh, but uh, I'd like to, before the questions, I'd like to read some of those uh, thoughts or ideas shared by a few, of, a few members in the audience. Denise uh, was actually mentioning about Philippine psychology. She said this is more of, I think these are not questions, but somehow kind of like they're just sharing some of their ideas. Uh, uh, this is more of a manifestation than a question. In Philippine psychology, we have a related concept to air reading, referred to as pakikiramdam or shared inner perception. While well, there are downsides to air reading in our culture, these downsides are augmented or addressed by kagandahang loob or shared humanity. There are also other non-confrontational values that help us avoid conflict. These values are not captured by the Western context. As researchers, we have to explore communication within our cultural context. Yeah, I, that's a very good uh, mm -hmm. direction, Denise. Thanks for saying that. Uh, there's another idea or comment shared by uh, Carmen Sita. If Carmen Sita is here, 
she said, I think it is also possible to continue using Western theories in studying Asian cultures. What I have been doing is using the existing Western theories, then validate them to adapt to the culture. That way I help in rich ways to study my culture instead of not using Western theories mm -hmm. simply because they are foreign. So uh, over to you, Professor, if you want to react to that. Yes, um, definitely. We have to begin somewhere. Uh, building a theory from, from scratch is very difficult, if not impossible. So deliberately knowing that Western theories cannot be fully applied to non-Western uh, cultural contexts, you can still use Western theories in order to see to what extent they can explain what happens in the non-Western non world and what, what, whatever deviates, so to speak, from the, from the uh, a theoretical application can, come, can become a very important substance of a new theory. For example, I, from, from, from my master's thesis years ago, I, I, I compared Japanese college students' speeches and also American college students' speeches. I applied deliberately the Western rhetorical standards to Japanese speeches. So those Japanese speeches, if I applied those uh, Western rhetorical standards were all failures. Uh, Japanese students would not use any statistics. They would not use any examples. Their logic was all messed up. There was no logical connection between point A and point B. And the conclusion came from nowhere. So those Japanese speeches would be completely failures according to the uh, US or Western standards. So whatever deviate, so, but those Japanese speeches were very persuasive to their, uh, to their Japanese audience members. So what constitutes Japanese persuasion is something that cannot be explained by US theories of rhetoric. So it is perfectly okay. It is preferable to use a US theory as a, as a foil, so, so to speak, against which you can, you can, you can project uh, whatever does not fit and try to come up with an, with an explanation of that part that does not fit that the US or Western theories. So starting with the US theory is not only uh, not bad, but also it is, uh, all, it is all, also a very productive way of beginning any research study. Definitely, I, I agree with you 100%. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Professor, for the explanation. There are a few more questions. If you have time, would you like to answer those questions? Uh, okay, there, are, there are so many of them. So I, yeah. I, are you so, going to be able to give, uh, give these to me in writing so that I can okay. write, write up a, a brief response to each one of them? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, yeah, because I'm, all, I'm also concerned of, of the time uh, you have in Hawaii. It's, it's I think, <laughs> late in the evening now. Uh, there are more very interesting questions. So uh, Paul is asking a lot of questions. Sarah Vanna Kanan, there's a question from Jatin and an anonymous attendee and even Lori Lee. So please, if, if you can type your email on chat, I can link you to Professor Miyahara, is that okay? So he can answer your question via email? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. How about those questions that are li listed on Q and A? Uh, are they going to be uh, handed to me later on? Uh, yes, we can send them to you, Professor. Okay, okay. It may, it may take me some time, but I, I would like to respond to each one of them because it's it's uh, uh, educational to me as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much to our audience who remained with us, uh, uh, who listened to Professor. Miyahara's uh, lecture and who really were very engaged to your to your talk, Professor. That they that the questions just keep coming and coming. So you know, what, what, one more little thing that I like to say about myself is that I I'm staying with my daughter who lives in Hawaii now. Uh, she was born in the United States, so she is a du dual citizen, Japanese and American, and she's married married to uh, James, who is originally from Malaysia. Uh, 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 James, James' father is Indian and his mother is a Filipino. 
And we have two grandchildren. So our grand, uh, grandchildren are 25% Filipino, 25% Indian, and 50% Japanese. That's how intercultural my family is. And by talking to James, who's, as I said, is originally from Malaysia, I have been learning, learning a lot about uh, Malaysian culture. And it's very different from Japanese culture. So as I said before, uh, we cannot really put all those Asian cultures together as though there is only one Asian culture. That's the, that's the dilemma and also the great misunderstanding that a lot of people from European American countries seem to have. So that's another uh, challenge that we have to uh, keep in our mind. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, from the bottom of our hearts, right from Singapore or Southeast Asia, we'd like to thank you, Professor Miyahara, for your time. Uh, for those who ask some of those questions, uh, please type your email on chat. I would like to link you to Professor Miyahara so that he can find time to answer to your questions. And maybe it's the beginning of a collaborative uh, yeah. study for, 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 for you who are interested to really pursue uh, the, 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 the pursue communication as a growing field. So that's one. Second is if you have time uh, before you leave, uh, our audience before you leave, please try to take the poll, a very simple question on poll so that we would know what we can improve, what else we can do for future public online lectures. So professor, thank you so much for your time. To all the audience, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for coming over and for engaging with us in this conversation. Thank you and keep Thank safe. Thank you very much. Have a great time.